This is an opening question I ask everyone who I interview. Could you introduce yourself and say what it is that you are known for? Uh, my name is Wayne Cox, and um, for the last, oh gosh, don't even want to do the math, number of years, I've been a, a broadcaster, which uh, meant radio, television, I even did some live things, did some movies, but uh, overall, just a, a broadcaster for most of my life. What is your earliest memory of film and television? You mean being on it or, or watching? Ever seeing it. Ever seeing it. Um, gosh. It would be to go way back, um, I guess when, just when I was a teenager, I became captivated with television, mostly through, oh, shows like, well, Steve Allen had a show on, I guess the early, uh, Tonight Show, and, um, there's a Merv Griffin show, and Mike Douglas show, and those, those kind of shows. Soupy Sales had a, a show on that was a lot of fun, and, and of course, you know, being a kid watching cartoons on Saturdays, that kind of a deal, but, um, uh, yeah, those would be my my first and the, and the first memory of radio would have been listening to a hockey game on a on a radio because I guess I would be about six, seven, seven or eight years old. We didn't have a TV then; um, we just had a radio. And so my dad would always put the hockey games play by play of the hockey games on uh, on radio, and we'd sit around and look at newspapers and listen to the radio. What kind of hobbies did you have growing up? I didn't, I didn't have many hobbies. I, I was, I was into sports a lot. I played soccer, uh, a lot of baseball, loved baseball. Yeah, that, that, that occupied most of my time. I didn't have a, a like a hobby hobby. The hobby would be sports. So that, that's where I was. And could you talk about your formal education? Uh, pretty simple. <laughs> uh, grade school and, uh, high school and, and, and that's it. I, I just barely scraped through high school and then, uh, went right to work. I, it, it, school didn't really captivate me. I, uh, I don't think it held my interest. So, uh, luckily I, I got into radio, uh, right after work, right after school. Did you always want to get into broadcasting? Uh, no, not at all. I, I, you know, like I say, I was really taken by all these, uh, TV shows that I, I was watching, like, uh, like I say, uh, Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas. And, and then along came Johnny Carson and, you know, watched him. And I, I read, I guess it was, a, a, someone wrote a column about Johnny uh, Carson. And he said he got his start in radio. And he said one of the big things he did was he would read and read aloud a lot. And that helped him in his radio brief radio career and then he from there he jumped into television so all of a sudden i thought well radio is kind of fun maybe and i you know typical kid in the in the 60s uh listening to you know, rock and roll radio and that's that seemed like that could be a lot of fun and i just went from there how did you get your first job in radio first job in radio came i was taking a it was a correspondence course uh, radio course, how to be an announcer. And it was done in the basement. We, we would meet once a week and it would be in the basement of this radio station. And, and the, uh, the, the course was caught, uh, taught by the uh, program director of the radio station. And he would, create, we'd go home and we'd make little tapes, you know, reading commercials and newscasts. And then we'd bring our tape to him once a week and he would do a critique on it. And one day we, we arrived there and he said, Hey, he said, um, we've got an opportunity. If anyone wants it, um, we're starting the first underground rock and roll radio station north of San Francisco and west of Toronto. And what we need are operators, people to start and stop records and start and stop tapes that announcers had already recorded. And anybody who wants in can jump in. It's a dollar an hour. And you can uh, quit any time you want. And so I, I put my hand up right away. I say, I, phew, to get in the, in the door of the radio station was really something. And so I took the advantage of that. And what I would do is I would do the shift of, of being a, a, an operator of, of these radio shows. But then after it was finished, I would take the records and take all the scripts and go into the production room and pretend to do a radio show and, make tapes of that. And it was through those tapes I would send out to try and get 
a real job, like on the air. And that the, the first on-air job I had was in Quinell, British Columbia, in Canada. And that was, um, oh gosh, that was 1968. What was the, do you know, remember the name of the radio station and the call sign? Oh yeah, CKCQ in Quinell. They had a sister station, CKWL in Williams Lake. In 1968, in a one-station market, you pl- you played every kind of music. Uh, you played country music part of the day. Uh, I would operate for a German fellow who would come in and play German music for an hour, and you'd read the news. You'd uh, have a thing called message time. People who lived way out in the bushes uh, would send messages to, to to people, and you'd read those. So you did everything. I even pulled the plug on the transmitter at, uh, at night when, when the day of broadcasting was finished. So uh, it was a terrific training ground because you, you got to do everything. Was that station the first station where you ever appeared on air, or was that at a different station? Uh, no, well, the, the very, I can't even really, I can't even say it was on air. I, I gave a couple of uh, station breaks at that very first one where I was an operator, and that was uh, CKLG FM. And that's about all I said. You know, you're listening to CKLG FM. That's it. You know, that's all they would allow me to do. So this, the one in Quinell, was the very first time I actually had a, a disc jockey kind of show. How did you get that job uh, when you first became an actual DJ? I would send out these tapes, audition tapes, and I, I just, you know, flooded the market. I'd, I'd send them anywhere. The one time I got a reply, it was from this this radio station. It was kind of it was kind of a sad thing. They said we want to talk to you. Can you get up here? And so it was about a nine hour drive to get there. And when I got there, I had a, you know a bit of an interview with uh, the program director and everything. And then I and I got the job. But I found out the the reason the job came available was the guy on the air had died. He had, he was in a car crash, and so it was kind of a kind of a sad way to get into the business. But you know, it was an opening, and I grabbed it. Remember what you said on the audition tape? Oh no, gee, that's so long ago. It, it while it would be would be introducing records, uh, maybe reading a couple of commercials, maybe reading a couple of uh, news stories, uh, and then you know, taking you get the in, intro to the song. A few seconds of the song, and then a few seconds at the end. You edit the, the middle out, and yeah, it was just a normal kind of an audition tape at the time. But it was uh, well, it was good enough to get the job. So yeah, I drove up there in nine hours with a buddy of mine and had the interview, and turned around and just drove right back. So it was like <laughs> an eighteen-hour driving day, and it, it was probably a full twenty-four hours. And and then got home, and then got word that I uh, I got the job. So turned around and <laughs> drove back up. And what year was that? That was 1968, mm-hmm. fall of 68. And I was there till the fall of 69. What was their format? Uh, like I say, it was a little bit of everything. It was, uh, it was country for, for most of it, uh, most of the day. Some of the day would be middle of the road kind of stuff. Very, very light rock if, if we ever played any of that. And the, the broadcast day was just from six in the morning till eleven o'clock at night, and you know they signed off. And I asked the general manager one time when I was doing the evening show, and I pulled the plug at eleven o'clock. And one day I asked him, I said, eleven o'clock seems like kind of a weird time. How come it isn't midnight? Uh, that would make more sense." And he said, "Oh well, the guy on who was on before you, he, he complained because he never got to go to any parties." By the time you, by the time you signed off at midnight and cleaned up and everything. So we figured out, well, okay, how about 11 o'clock? So it was pretty loose. Do you remember the next radio station that you ended up working at? Yeah, that was, uh, CHNL in Kamloops. It's another, uh, interior, the interior British Columbia station, smaller market, but it was actually a two station market. So it went from a one station market in Quinell to two in Kamloops. And, uh, it was, uh, it was exciting because there was, ooh, how many of us? Five of us or seven of us? And we actually put the radio station on the air the very first day of broadcasting for this station. And, uh, that was kind of exciting. But it, uh, it again was, um, uh, sort of a middle of the road 
kind of music format. It was all music all day long with, you know, newscasts and things like that. Did you have a performance or a persona or did you just operate as Wayne Cox or did you think that you ever affected any kind of character when you were a disc jockey at that time? Yeah, no, I, I didn't. And, uh, I didn't even, I didn't even change my name, which probably would have been a good idea. A lot of guys were doing that in the day, but you know, with a name like Cox, I mean, all my life I've been open to jokes, right? So I, and I really, I guess I, I, I should have done it, but I, I thought, well, I, that's just me. That's my name, you know, and that, that was how I, I attacked it all the time. It's just, I would just be me. And how long did you operate at that radio station? About a year and a half, and I didn't know it at the time, but a big station in uh, in Vancouver, bigger market, the big station in Vancouver, they were looking for a couple of guys, and the general manager's brother was working in Kamloops, where I was working on the air, and so he told his brother, who was the general manager of CKNW, that he listened to this guy all the time, and if he was ever looking for someone, Maybe you want to try him. And that guy was me. So they sent the program director up and he sat in a, in a hotel for a couple of days listening to my show and then offered me the job. And it was a job that if, if I was ever going to go to Vancouver to work, that was the one station I, I wanted to work at. It was stable. It was the number one station. It was middle of the road music. A lot of the rock and roll stations in those days were like a revolving door. I mean, guys were coming in and going out. Whereas this station was solid. Yeah, I jumped at that. And, uh, yeah, I was there for, uh, oh gosh, seven years, I guess. So in 71, the Canadian content mandates came into effect. How, mm-hmm. did, how did that affect you, if it affected you at all? Yeah, I, was it 71? I guess it was. It was somewhere around in there, yeah. It, it really affected us when it first first came out because uh, it was totally cart before the horse. I mean, it, you know, we were supposed to play, what was it, 30 or 33 percent Canadian content. And there wasn't 33 percent Canadian content in our music library. So the result was uh, playing a lot of the songs over and over and over because we just didn't have we just didn't have the content. They tried to help us out by putting together a, a thing called the Canadian Talent Library where all of a sudden they pushed out all this music. Well, I mean, it was music, but it was most, mostly, you know, Eastern Canadian musicians, and they were doing cover versions of songs we were already playing by, by huge stars, right? So it was a, it, when it first started, it was, a, it was a real chore to come up with 33%. We were already playing some good Canadian artists anyway, you know, the Guess Who, they had big hits out, and, you know, Anne Murray was for, you know, she was starting out, and, but, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they had it in their minds that they wanted to push Canadian talent and give the Canadian talent a little, because we were playing mostly American artists, it's just the way it was. So yeah, to start off, it was tough, but as, as it went on year after year after year, it got a little easier. Were you doing radio commercials at that time for the company? Uh, yeah, we all we all had uh, every announcer on the, on the air and a couple of production guys would have you know they they were local commercials say but they were produced properly and they were produced in a studio and that was part of our job we would do our three hour radio show and then we would go and pick up a folder that was filled with commercials and we go and and do commercials for you know whatever however long it took you. Did you do any live action commercial, television commercials at that time, or did that not come till after you started working in news? Uh, no, that was um, my first, I guess the first first television I ever did was a commercial, and it was for um, a travel trailer company. There was a guy I met at the TV station I, I later worked at who was in the commercial production department, and we bumped into each other somewhere. and. I got a call from him one day, and he said, hey, do you want to do a TV commercial? I said, well, I've never done one before. He says, well, I yeah, think it'll be all right. Come on. And so I went out and travel trailer was the first one. How many do you think you did over your career? TV commercials? TV and radio, uh, or both. TV, oh, radio is nutty. I mean, uh, if, you, if you count the stuff we did every single day, I mean, it's just in the thousands. But 
for TV, um, gosh, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 or so. Yeah. Were any of them national or were they all primarily West Canada? Yeah, there was one national, Canadian national one for an airline. Um, and then one that uh, ran in the States, I didn't have a speaking part in, but it paid really well. <laughs> the, uh, the residuals on that were terrific because it, the it was for uh, Toyota and it was being played in, you know, New York and Boston and LA and, you know, some big cities and, it was fun to get those checks. That was fun. Yeah. Now, did you make the transition from the radio station to television hosting, or was there an in-between, or did you go to any other radio stations prior to making the transition to television? Uh, gee, I, I was doing both a lot of the time in my career. I did that, uh, I did that commercial for the uh, travel trailer company uh, while I was doing radio, and then... Through that, I hosted a, um, a hockey show. It was uh, called Wednesday Night Hockey, and they would run the local the Vancouver Canucks hockey game, and we'd televise it. And I was the between-periods host. So after the first period, they cut to me in the studio, and I'd interview the, the analyst, maybe interview a couple of players, and then it was time for the next period, so back to the play-by-play -play guy. So that was that was one of my first TV actual you know hosting jobs. Any fun memories of interviewing the hockey players? Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Again, that's yeah, that's so long ago. Uh, no, uh, most of the most of the guys were pretty good because I you know I never played hockey. Uh, I'm one of those rare Canadians that you know, I, I've never played hockey, but but I used to watch a lot of hockey. My dad played hockey. My uncles played hockey. So uh, I knew the game, but I never played it. And I think the guys I, were inter I was interviewing, they're all very nice, but uh, I think they, they kind of realized that I <laughs> I wasn't a player. Where I, so they were kind to me, to put it that way. So was the Vancouver show the first regular show that you had after that, or was there another show prior to that? Mm, no, I think that was the first. Uh, there was the hockey show that I hosted. But again, I was doing radio at the time also. And then it went from the hockey. Then I was filling in for the weather guy on the news, six o'clock news on the same station. He was a disc jockey too, Fred Latrimal. And Freddie called me one day and he said, Hey, if I ever get sick or something happens, um, you know, would you want to fill in for me? And so I said, sure. What do I know from the weather? I look out the window We're like everybody else. I wasn't a meteorologist. But neither was he. He was just a disc jockey, too. And in those days, there were very few meteorologists that were TV weathermen. So that, that was fine, and, and that's how it went. Uh, he'd get sick or he'd go on holidays or whatever happened, and I'd fill in for him. So that was kind of the second TV thing. And then, then an opening came on the Vancouver show, which was a different TV station. And that opportunity came up, and so I, I left being the weather guy, and went into the Vancouver show as one of the hosts. And what was the Vancouver show, and what was your role on it? I was one of, uh, at any given night, we'd have three or four hosts. And it was kind of like the Today Show or Good Morning America, but with no newscast. And it was two hours live television every night uh, from 7 till 9 o'clock. And I was one of the hosts. So I would do some of the interviews. It was all interviews or bands. They might have like a, a forum set up where people would fill the, the audience and, you know, they debate some, some subject for, you know, a couple of segments. Each segment was like seven minutes long. So your interview would be seven minutes unless it was somebody really special and you go into the second segment after a commercial break. But I usually got all the lightweight stuff. I got, you know, the, the clowns and the jugglers and the musicians and the and the other hosts would take take on politicians and authors and things like that. And my role was more of just the the light side of things, and because a lot of these a lot of the other hosts didn't want to be talking to a clown, they wanted they wanted to talk to a politician, right? Well, I didn't want to talk to a politician. I'd rather talk to a clown. <laughs> They're more fun. So that was my role as kind of the, the, the lighter guy on the, on the whole show. And yeah, it ran uh, two hours every night. And if you can imagine trying to book 
uh, guests, someone that'll, that can carry seven minutes and is somewhat interesting. So seven minute segments all the way around for two hours. Okay. Fill that show. Now fill Tuesday's show. Now fill Wednesday's show with something different. Uh, it was quite a remarkable show, really. And the, the guy who uh, owned the station, Daryl Duke, who was a Hollywood uh, director, what he wanted the show to do was to uh, reflect what was going on in the city. So it was very important to have local politicians on if some band or, you know, uh, like a band would come in like George Thorogood or B.B. King or something like that. And they would always come on our show and play um, and promote their show that they're, you know, in town for. And so it was it was a great cross section of people. Any we always thought, you know, pretty much anything that we could move or breathe and talk, we would book and they'd be on the show. It was it was lots of fun. Any memorable interviews or any memorable segments that you were witness to or that you were part of? Oh, gosh, there was lots. Uh, one of them I always think of um, was, uh, you know, the you know the musician George Thorogood. Yep. Uh, yeah. In the Destroyers. They, you know, that three-piece three, three piece loudest band in the world kind of thing. So George, I didn't know him, but he came in and we taped an afternoon uh, of him playing and then a quick interview. So I was fine. Um, they played. I jumped up on the stage and started to interview him. And so I say, well, George, you know, great to have you here. And he say, yeah, uh, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, <laughs> and so I thought, nah, he's the star. I'm not going to correct him. You know, so I just went with it. And I say, oh, where are you guys playing? Well, Dwayne, we're playing at the uh, theater tonight. And uh, and I said, where are you going next? Well, Dwayne, we're going to go. You know, he just kept emphasizing getting my name wrong. And I, I just ignored it. I just kept on I was just being pleasant. He's the. He's the guest. And so, well, will you play another song for us? Oh, Dwayne, we'd love to. So they played another, <laughs> played another song. And that was it. We, we end. They pack up their gear. Away they go. I go back into the, the, the showroom. And about, uh, oh gosh, an hour later, the phone rings. It's George Thorogood's manager. And he says, oh man, he says, I got to stop. George wants me to apologize uh, about that Dwayne thing. And I said, well, no, that, that doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. And he says, no, no, no. He was doing it on purpose. He, he was trying to, he was trying to upset you. He was trying to pull a gag on you. He knew your name, but he just, he wanted to see how you'd react and you didn't react. <laughs> and I said, well, no, I didn't react because he's the, he's the big star. Oh, he, George, he's, he feels so badly about it. He wants to apologize. I said, ah, man, man, don't worry. But there, there were so many, I mean, so many. Th- things that happen on that show like uh, we had Bo Diddley on and uh, had, it was a three camera shoot and there were all these big cameras on, on wheels right on the studio floor director on the, the center camera I remember the director calls for the, the guy to go in on him go in on him so this guy runs his camera great big camera at the stage didn't see it but there was a cable across the floor well the camera hit the cable and it pitched forward Right at Bo Diddley. Well, Bo Diddley was stopped. Like, oh my God. And there's this huge crash, right? And this camera goes down. And, uh, he came back two years later and he was still talking about that. He, he said, oh man, he says, I remember the time I was here before and the camera crashed. And oh, we, I don't know. We had two hours every night and I did that show for over five years. I should have been writing down things that happened. There's so many things happened. Show. Was that live music that they were performing? Yeah, every, everything. Well, I shouldn't say everything was live. Everything was live except if we had, we, if we sent like a, a news reporter out to cover some story that day, uh, some big story, that would be on videotape. But otherwise, everything was live. Yeah. Now, what was the the consensus of Vancouver at the time as a media hub? Was it seen as sort of the next Toronto or was it... What do you remember about that? It was good. Um, we had, oh gosh, I don't know. We had three or four TV stations. We had lots of radio stations. Um, we were the biggest thing, well, biggest thing west of Toronto. So we were, I would guess we were the second or third largest market in the country. 
Montreal was big and Toronto was big and, and Vancouver was big. Eventually, I know you left and worked at CKVU TV. How did you get no, that? That was at CK. Oh, it was at CK. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, did you become an sure. okay? And how long were you doing that job for? Uh, that was I did. I guess I did the uh, I did the Vancouver show. I guess about three or four years. Uh, then I went in. I, I was a news anchor at that station for two years, um, and then got got into some half-hour strip shows for a year, and then they they scaled back the Vancouver show to a one-hour show. And, uh, they asked me to come back and do that, but it only lasted for one year, and then, then it was over. How did Second Honeymoon come about? Second Honeymoon came out of, well, that was back at BCTV, at the uh, the station where I was uh, filling in on the weather and things like that. I just got I got a call from my agent and said, hey, they're they got a, a casting call out, and they're looking for a, a host for this game show. And I said, oh, okay. So um, I went downtown, and um, uh, Jerry Gilden, Wink Martindale's partner, they were the ones who produced the second Honeymoon. And Jerry Gilden was there. Wink wasn't there, but Jerry was. And we, I don't know, we just hit it off. I, I walked in, and it was one of those deals. That, the same thing had happened with Dustin Hoffman when I interviewed him, but I walked in and I had a blue blazer. Jerry Gilden had a blue blazer. I had a striped tie. He had a striped tie. I had gray flannel pants. He had gray flannel pants, which is the same scenario when I interviewed Dustin Hoffman. I walked in and we were dressed exactly the same. But Jerry Gilden and I just exchanged a few things back and forth, and there was really no... I didn't run through the show. I mean, he said the show was based on the newlywed game concept. Where you ask questions and then you, if you match the answers, you get points. And I, I, I got the job, so I started in on it. Yeah, it was, it was a difficult show, show to do because we had, there were three families and the families could be anywhere from four people to six or eight people uh, in their family, kids and moms and dads. Like I say, it was like the newlywed game where mom and dad are isolated, can't hear, and then you ask the kids a question like, about mom or dad, how would they react? And if mom and dad came out and matched the answer, they got points. Team with the most points won. This is a beautiful part about the show. It took the greed out of game shows because the winning team won a honeymoon for mom and dad. So the kids didn't win anything on this other than what a nice thing to do to our parents. But uh, And some of the people had never had a first honeymoon, so <laughs> it was really exciting for them. Do you remember the, any of the kind of questions that you asked? Well, that that was one of the one of the things. Uh, it was the show was done for the Christian Broadcast Network, and they were very particular on what questions we could ask. It, it had to be squeaky clean, and, and uh, one of the, well, one of the questions that was thrown out that we didn't use, and I think the writer got fired. It was um, okay, kids. Would your mom wear a saran wrap bikini to the beach? And they, uh, no, no, can't ask that. Can't ask that question. It was a little too racy for the Christian broadcast network, right? They wanted to keep it totally clean. But it was the, there were those kinds of uh, questions, like um, if mom and dad went to a restaurant, uh, what would mom order? Or, you know, would she order a steak or would she order chicken? And so when mom came back out, well, mom, what would you order? You know, or chicken or, or steak? Well, chicken. Chicken's right. Ah, you win a point. You know, this kind of stuff. No, that question and questions like that, were you part of the writing or were you there when they were no. writing the questions or did you, how did you know about that question? Oh, I knew the writers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Especially the one who got fired. <laughs> because it wasn't the first time he had. I mean, he had even worse questions than that. But, you know, it wasn't. I don't think he was fired just based on that one. <laughs> you talked about that meeting with Wink Martindale and Jerry Gilden. Were they there on a daily basis when they were making the show? I think Jerry was there more than Wink was. Because I think Wink was still doing game shows in L.A. So he would go back and forth. Jerry was there more often. A guy by the name of Tony Blake that I still I still keep in touch with, a uh, wonderful guy. He's a screenwriter, but he was the uh, line producer, and he was there every day. Uh, yeah, he, he 
he's a terrific guy. We still keep in touch by uh, email and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. What, what, what do you think was his contribution to the show? What do you think he brought to it? Uh, Tony, Tony or Jerry? Or Tony. Tony was um, he had a he had a really good energy, a terrific energy. He knew games, and he was a New Yorker who lived in L.A. And New Yorkers, uh, I guess, talk faster and walk faster than any people on Earth, I think. Uh, whereas West Coast Canada, we're pretty laid back. We're we're almost, uh, you know, in comparison, we're almost asleep all the time. <laughs> so he brought this wonderful energy and curiosity that helped me a lot. I, I could look over at the table and Tony would be going, expand on that, right? And so I would ask more questions and... Yeah, he was he was terrific. Were there any hosts that you admired at the time or that you tried to emulate? You know, I I really wasn't a game show guy. I I didn't watch very many game shows. So the answer I guess was nobody. Uh you know, everybody knows Bob Barker. Uh I knew Wink I knew of Wink Martindale. I'd seen him on a, a couple of shows and but I wasn't a regular game show kind of person. I was more of a variety, talk show, sports kind of TV guy. And how long did you host Second Honeymoon for? Oh, Second Honeymoon was, uh, I guess we did one or two seasons. Yeah, 80, 87, 88, sort of in there. Yeah, uh, it, it went across Canada, and it also uh, went to the Christian Broadcast Network. And, yeah. and were you still working at CKU, CKVU at the time, or...? Uh, where was I then? No, I was doing a talk show, radio talk show at the time on a radio station called CJOR in Vancouver. Horrible, horrible situation. I, I just, you know, I tried to, the guy, I knew the general manager of the station. He was looking for a talk show and he host and he contacted me and I said, no, I said, no, I'd be horrible. I would just be awful. I say, you know, be a talk show host. You, you, you know, you have, you have to have all these editorials that you do. I, I said, I don't even care what I think. Why would anybody else care what I think? Oh, he says, you'll be great. But at the time, I was a I was a Mr. Mom. I had two boys at home, 10 and 12, and I needed a job. So I did that, put put some food on the table. And then um, then the game show came along, which was great. That was a bonus. Um, yeah. But I was doing both at that at the same time, and that, not that year. Yeah. And then after Second Honeymoon, you did another game show called Talk About. So could you talk about talk about? <laughs> I'm sure that you hear that a million times. <laughs> yeah, it's a, no talk about was terrific. Mark Maxwell Smith, who I know you've talked to, uh, he he he's uh, I'm still in touch with with Mark, and um, uh, he's just a marvelous guy. Again, a New Yorker again, high energy, lots of. He's always thinking. He's always got these thoughts going, and um, again, I was called for an audition by my agent, and I went. To this, um, well, to CBC television station, way down in the basement, and uh, Mark was sitting there. I'd been given an outline of the game on paper. I had no idea what this game was about. I couldn't figure it out. But went in and kind of went through the paces, not quite knowing what was going on, and got the job. And uh, once, <laughs> once I got the job, and once I was able to go through the game a couple of times. Then I went, oh, I see. Now I understand. You know, now, now I get it. Yeah, but Mark was just so, so much fun to work with and, and so creative and so brilliant and, and such a nice man, too, and very funny. Mark knows I'm doing this interview, and he sends his regards and is grateful oh. to know you, and he says he still has the red Z. <laughs> Could you explain yeah. that to me as well as to the people listening? <laughs> Red Z, yeah. Um, well, what happened was, so we're we're doing this show, uh, talk about for CBC, and a, it's a co-production with D. L. Taffner out of New York. D. L. Taffner was a big company that used to bring the uh, Thames productions in from London, and anyway, they wanted to do their own game show. Hired Mark, who had game show experience, and he came up with talk about. So they did a co-production with CBC. So the big market. We were on uh, all the, the Fox-owned and operated stations throughout the U.S. That's a big market compared to the Canadian market, the CBC. So they were trying to do was 
trying not to make it sound like a Canadian game show. And so there are certain Canadian things that go on. And one of them is the letter Z. Our letter Z is pronounced Z. Why? I have no idea. But in America, it's a Z. In Canada, it's a Z. So one of the, one of the talk about puzzles, uh, had to do, deal with Zorro. Now Zorro with a sword would make what? Z. A Z. Not in Canada, he doesn't. He makes a Z, right? So <laughs> we're going through this, the puzzle, and of course, the guy, the contestants are Canadian because we're shooting in Canada. That's where our pool is. And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, yeah Zorro. And you've got to talk about what you're puzzled about. So yeah, Zorro. He's this guy. He's got a mask. He's got a cape. He's got a, oh yeah, he's got a sword. He's sort of, and he makes a big Z. And Mark just went, oh no. Goes, oh no. Cut, cut. So I think we threw that puzzle out and put in Superman. So, the guy goes away, he goes again. Says, Superman, yeah, he's got this cape and, and he flies and everything, and he's he's got a Z on his no, he's got an S on his chest. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mark goes, oh no. So I I, I got a, a big red Z letters Z and I put it in a big picture frame and I I gave it to him with a little caption underneath the dreaded red Z and he's got it on his office wall and but, but there was that and there was also uh, one of the one of the contestants' name was was Guy. That's French, right? Like that's that's his G U one. Mark Mark says, uh, do you think for the purposes just of this show, we can call you Guy? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, the, the guy Guy says, sure, whatever. Well, I don't care. Yeah. So there were little things like that we tried to avoid, and the red Z was uh, sort of emblematic of trying to keep it and of course i'm i'm struggling every time i open my mouth because you know we're also famous for oot and a boot you know and uh so what is the name of the show talk, talk about. about okay so i've got to consciously try and make it sound like talk about instead of talk a boot not that i say boot but to you it sounds like i'm saying boot i guess because we get it all the time uh, when I used to work down in Los Angeles, I, somebody would go, oh, you're Canadian. Uh, I said, well, how do you know that? They said, what? Well, you said, you said boot or something. I said, I didn't say boot. <laughs> I said, I said boat. No, this is boot. Anyway, um, so we were uh, struggling all the time. I was struggling all the time to try and make it sound like talk about. Were the contestants told to change the way they spoke or acted? No. No, the only the, that was the only about the only couple of times that that came up. The the game was just too it went too too quickly like for the contestants. Uh, for people who don't know how the game is played, you you get a, a topic like say apples, uh, and you've got 20 seconds to talk about it. And uh, what we've done is we've compiled 10 words that are associated with that word apple, and it could be you know peel. Core, stem, orchard, tree, Eve, red, Garden of Eden, delicious. Yeah, uh, there, there's a million possibilities, but we have already chosen ten. If you say one of our ten words, boom, 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 you get a point. Then the other team comes. We cover those words over. The other team comes out, and based on the words you didn't say, they try and guess what you were talking about. So the beauty of the thing is, let's say with apples, you, you, you say a whole bunch of things like that, and you leave you leave the words, our words, you leave orchard, stem, and peel. Well, that could be an orange. That could be a grapefruit. That could be a pear. It could be anything. So that was the trick of the, of, of the game, and that's what made it so interesting, because people would, at home, and people... Even in the audience, we'd, they would be calling things out. You know, they, they they'd be wanting to participate, and that's one of the beauties of a of a good game show is audience participation. Did you get the keywords in advance, or were you in the dark in the same? Yeah, way you did. Yeah, yeah, I I had to get them because I had to first of all know what we're talking about, uh, or they're talking about. 
yeah, I would, I would sort of check off as they said, so I would know how many, how many they got. But yeah, no, I, I, I could have that, but they, they wouldn't have any idea. They wouldn't even know what they would always get, um, you know, a, a choice. What would you like to talk about? Apples or oranges? Uh, but that would be the first time they would ever hear what their, what, what the puzzles were. What attributes do you think make for a good game show host? Um, hmm. I think for the most part, you have to enjoy people. Um, but the other thing too, I think it's, it's the same with an interview show or anything. You have to be a good listener. If you're a good listener, it, it just flows. I mean, you just, you, you just ask what you would ask because it's based on what the person has just finished saying. And, and, and as far as the mechanics, uh, that's the other, there's mental gymnastics that go on with uh, game shows in that, especially games that have to be concluded within that 22 minute seg, uh, 22 minute space. So it's a, a matter of speeding up and slowing down depending on how much time you have left to, to get this thing over with. What do you think made you different from other game show hosts, Canadian or American at the time? I don't think I did anything terribly different. Um, I know, um, gosh, I was talking to, uh, you know, Mark Summers? Yeah, from Double Dare. Mark and I had a conversation once because he came up to do a, a celebrity version of Talk About. Um, and uh, Mark Maxwell Smith is a good friend of Mark Summers, and uh, he asked Mark to come up um, because we wanted to test to see if celebrities uh, could play our or would play our game and wouldn't be uncomfortable with maybe saying something that sounded kind of stupid because the, the game is all played from the gut. It's not played from the brain. And so Mark Summers came up and uh, we had a really good conversation because at the time, well, we we're both the same age and, you know, he had very successful uh, game going with the, Nickelodeon, I think, wasn't it? Uh, yep, Nickelodeon Double Dare. Yeah, Double Dare, yeah. I remember standing on the stage with him, and we just, in, in a break, and we were talking and everything, saying, you know, we might be in a good position here, career-wise, because we're we're younger than some of the older, you know, Bob Barker-type hosts who may be calling it quits soon, and we might be able to slide in as over the next few years, which... Sounded good on paper, but then the game show, you know, everything is cyclical. Police shows, hospital shows, game shows, they have their ups and their downs. And we kind of, I guess it wasn't to be because we're, we're, uh, we're on the down slope, I guess. You know. Now there was a talk about, talk about being sold to the Americas, being made in America. Would you have hosted it in America if given the opportunity? Oh, if given the opportunity, I would, sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, it was, uh, at the, at the time it was, um, I, I did a bunch of run throughs, uh, in Los Angeles, which is a, a step before a pilot, uh, for a show. And that was interesting. And, and I was hopeful that I could land something, but, uh, yeah, never, never did. But if, but talk about, you know, as you probably know, Mark probably told you there's an, uh, there was an Irish version. There was a, a United Kingdom version. I think there was, Who's the other one? Sweden. Sweden. Sorry. Sweden. There you go. Yeah. He says there was yeah. one in Japan too that I gotta find. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Why do you think it didn't last? Why do you think it didn't last longer? Well, I the, the way it was explained to me was that CBC didn't want to do it anymore. Now, CBC is a very strange character. It's a, a big national television network that likes to represent all aspects of the country and. Uh, you know, reflecting Canada, da da da. They had never really done a game show before. They did a very successful panel show called Front Page Challenge, but it wasn't really a game. So they went into this game show thing with a couple of couple of different games. Talk about was the most successful, and uh, we went a couple of went two two seasons, and then they went to negotiate. I guess with or Taffner went to negotiate with CBC for a third year. And CBC said, no, we don't want to, we don't want to do games anymore. And so 
Tafner thought, oh, okay, playing hardball, are you? Playing hardball, okay. They didn't realize, Tafner thought it was just a negotiation ploy, that we don't want to do it anymore, right? We want more money. or we want. So, uh, yeah, but uh, Tafner didn't realize they were dealing with a strange cat in CBC and that they really meant it. They weren't negotiating. They really meant it. And by the time they realized that, it was sort of too late in the game to try and find another co-production uh, company. And it kind of just went, just fell flat because we were so close to getting a syndication. Yeah, it was, and that's how it ended. So that's what I was told. Do you remember when you were told that or how you were told that? Yeah, it was, uh, we went to dinner, one of the guys from Tafner. And he said, you know, I've got some bad news. It, it's, it doesn't look like it's going to happen for a third year. And I said, oh. And he says, yeah. He says, um, we're trying to negotiate with CBC, but they, they, it doesn't look like they want to go, and we're running out of time. Uh, we've got to get a, a co-production deal with somebody. And now we have to get CBC first right of refusal. Then it, it did collapse. So I was kind of warned that it wasn't going to have a third year. You know, Canada had a lot of game shows, you know, they were made things like um, uh, the aforementioned headline, cha front page challenge, sorry, headline hunters, but they never aired here in the United States, but Second Honeymoon and Talk About both did. You know, mm. why do you think that they were able to succeed here in the United States and not just Canada? Uh, gee, I don't, I know, um, I know for sure uh, Second Honeymoon, I don't know what happened there, why it wouldn't continue on. That was strictly, a, yeah, that, well, it was a co-production deal too. But I think, I think talk about was more, uh, as it turned out, universal, uh, because of the play along ability, if that's a word. We even got word from some of the, um, what well, we saw, the technical crew. They were playing along. And that doesn't happen very often in the game show world. Usually the toughest critics are, are the crew. You know, the guy, the guy with the boom mic, the guy up in the lighting grid. And, switchers and these guys they've seen a lot and they're hard to impress and we got really positive remarks from these guys and they were playing along with the, with the game and i think that's what happened with the audience too people at home i would get i would get uh, letters from people saying that, you know this game's great and we play at dinner time dad will pick up the salt shaker and say okay 20 seconds talk about salt and the kid would have to talk about salt which was you know part of our game but yeah, it, it, I think it was play-along ability that, that made it successful in any country. They made a board game out of it. Do you still have that board game? I do. Yeah, it's very rare. <laughs> There's a, and, I, and I found another one. A buddy of mine found another one uh, at a garage sale. And it was kind of, the box was kind of beaten up, but it had all the puzzles and everything in it. So I, I had one, I got one still in plastic wrap. It had never been opened. And the other one was beaten up a little bit. But I got a letter from a guy who said that now that the talk about is in reruns now on game TV here in Canada, their family loves it. And, uh, and they tried to fashion the game for themselves. And he said, where do I get this home game that people are being given? And I said, I don't think you can get one. I don't know where it is. Well, this buddy of mine found it at a garage sale. So I wrapped it up and I, I sent it to this guy. And, and so I guess his family now sits around with the home version playing. Yeah. What was legal wise? Well, legal wise was a little a half hour show that was done out of Vancouver. I I was a, a co-host with a lawyer, a woman lawyer. The producers would find lawsuits. Then they'd go out and do a little uh, video, like a reenactment of something. And then it would come back to this, after that, it would come back to the studio and I would turn to the lawyer and say, so what happens? Now, is this person guilty or are they, you know, not guilty or should they be charged? Or So it was more of an informational thing. And it was, um, I guess, underwritten by the law society. I guess they were trying to get good public relations going and get people to try and understand how the law works. 91, acting crazy, Blair Murdoch. How did you get that job? I think I was approached by Blair based on the fact that I I had already done two game shows. So I was probably the only guy in, in Vancouver that had done game shows before, or two of them anyway. Yeah, so we did that. We did a couple of, a couple of, uh, 91, I think it was in 90, 
to 92, and then we picked up again in, in, a couple of years later, like in 94. And it, that's just based on charades, is all that is. And you got some pretty, you know, big name talent for a, you know, local, not a local show, but for a Canadian show. You guys had, you know, Mickey Dolenz, Meredith McRae, yeah. you had Marilyn Davis, I think, was on one. You know, how did, do you know, how did they were able to book such great talent to come to Canada, you know, for this game show? Yeah, that was, that was Blair Murdoch. He, he had connections, I guess, down in LA and he, he worked those connections and, and was able to, well, Jim Carter was one of them. Uh, Oh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Walker, Dino Might, uh, he was on the show and Sally Struthers. Yeah, we had some, we had some good names and, and they were fun people. 91 and then 94, but in 92, you became a weather personality for the news hour. Talk about that. The, everything that had sort of dried up, um, I was just freelancing. I, uh, I didn't have anything regular. The game shows were kind of over and I was just, Doing everything. I was doing TV commercials. I was doing movie bits, bit part movie things and anything, you know, again, to put money, uh, uh, food on the table. And a guy I used to work with, a cameraman at that, now this is back at BCTV where I used to fill in doing the weather. The cameraman was called into this meeting and they were going to put together a Saturday morning, uh, newscast, two, two hours, something like that, two, three hours on a Saturday morning. So they had their, they had the anchor, uh, they were looking around for a sports guy and they were looking around for a weather guy who could also do interviews and be out like a, at the beach or at a fair or, you know, always be out somewhere. Um, and so this cameraman said, well, he, he suggested me. He says, look, the guy, he's done live TV on the old Vancouver show for years. Uh, he's not afraid of doing live. He's not afraid of doing interviews. And he used to fill in doing the weather. And so they, they contacted me and I figured, yeah, why not? I'm not doing anything else on a Saturday morning. So they hired this other guy to do the sports, uh, Squire Barnes. And uh, he was like me. He was a, a freelancer. So it was quite funny. We were, we were a couple of loose cannons because we, we had other gigs. This was just one. A number of things so we didn't care if we got fired so we would we were like i say loose cannons we do goofy stuff say goofy stuff have lots of fun and and then go back to whatever we were doing again I mean, that usually was a bunch of radio and, and things like that so it, it turned into the saturday then the saturday show then the sunday show and then did that for a little while so i do tv on the weekends radio through the week so it was like a seven day week, but hey, it's a paycheck. And then the, uh, the guy on the news hour at six, the six o'clock news, the weather guy, he retired and they offered me to go from the weekend to do the Monday to Friday and, you know, bigger audience and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of how that evolved. A lot of game show hosts started out as weathermen and radio DJs did change subsequently in the years. Why do you think? You know, people who work in radio and people who work as weathermen tend to make for good hosts of live television or game shows. Yeah, I guess it's the the live aspect of it, and it's the uh, you're not really playing a character. You know, I interviewed enough actors on the going through the Vancouver show that I, I came to realize actors are way more comfortable being someone else. That's what they do. They're actors, right? They take on roles. To be themselves, I often found a lot of them were quite uncomfortable just, just being themselves. Whereas you know, radio disc jockeys or the, the weather guy, I'm, we're not trying to play an a, a part. We're not trying to be a butcher or a, a doctor or you know a, a, a lawyer. We're just us presenting and communicating with, hopefully communicating with the audience and telling them some information. Um, so I, I think that getting the grounding on radio and, you know, giving giving information like, like the weather, which doesn't really matter. I mean, it's either going to rain or it's not, at least in Vancouver. So there's a certain, if you, if you can, if you can handle the live aspect and you can just handle being yourself live, then uh, I guess that's part of it. But I know, uh, I guess most famous weatherman game show host is Pat Sajak. 
to see, uh, he was a weatherman in LA. And from what I hear the story, uh, Chuck Woolery was doing a Wheel of Fortune. And when he was trying to hold out for more money, uh, Merv Griffin just said, ah, I know a guy who can, t- who can do this. I watch him every night on the weather. Pulls in Pat Sajak, and there you go. Well, you brought up acting, and you brought up actors, and you were an actor in a number of television shows. You played a news anchor or a news personality. Do you think there's a big difference between acting as a news anchor and being an actual news anchor? Oh, yeah, yeah. How so? Well, uh, it's not not so much the mechanics of it. It's the, uh, it's the content. There's a lot of artistic license used in the movies for what news anchors say. Like, I remember going to auditions for me. I didn't get the job, and, but I, w- I would read what they had written. I'd go, you can't say this. <laughs> you get sued. <laughs> no, this is what we're doing. This is what we're reading. No, you can't do this. And so, um, so that aspect, of it, just the mechanics of it, yeah, it, it's fine. But, um, you know, without a, without a teleprompter, I'm, I'm just lost. I either make it up, or I read the teleprompter. My, I got a memory like a sieve. So, uh, any, any movie role I ever got, it was more than three lines. Uh, I, I was sunk. I'd, I'd have to have it written down somewhere. I was hopeless. <laughs> Do you remember being in the pilot for Sliders, the show? Oh, well, sli- I was, uh, what was I? I was a newsman. You're like a newsman for like the communist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, funny you should bring that up. I just got a royalty check for that. I don't even know what year that was. That was so long ago. I just got it last week. Six dollars <laughs> twenty cents. <laughs> uh, my royalties. Yeah, I think I've had about I don't know four or five of those, <laughs> but all about, all for about six bucks. <laughs> Sliders buys for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Ninety six, by the way, is when that was. That's when. Ninety six. Ninety six. Wow. Was there a lot of television production coming through Vancouver at that time? Uh, yeah, yeah, there was, and there's well, not right now because of the virus, but um, Vancouver's huge for uh, for for movie and television production, and and then yeah, it, it was it was going well then, yeah. Did you try out for any roles other than news anchors or news journalists or broadcasters? Mm-hmm. No, I think my first first TV thing I did was a thing called Letters from Frank and it started Art Kearney and I got a role as a cop. Now please uh, you know I'm five foot nine at best you know and at the time I was probably 150 pounds not really an intimidating looking cop even in a uniform but it was the it was one of the thrills of my life because I played right opposite Art Kearney who, of course, I idolized from the old uh, honeymooners days. You know, Art Carney was yelling at me, and uh, I had three lines: something about, "Did you see what he looked like? Which way did he go? And what was he driving?" And that's what all I had. But each time I laid down a line, Art Carney would scream at me uh, because he was so frustrated that the cops weren't going and finding his dog or whatever the, the guy kidnapped. But as it turned out, I, I later talked to him about it. Um, that was one of the first movies that uh, Michael J. Fox was in. And of course, Michael's from Burnaby, which is a suburb of Vancouver. And uh, we had talked after that. He related. Uh, we weren't in a scene together, but he was just a kid. When he was in the movie. Just got. Who had more lines, you or him? The, my, or Michael? You or Michael, yeah. Oh, God, Michael. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Starring role. Okay. Did you ever work with any other actors, performers who went on to become bigger names or more successful later on? Mm, no, because I, I really, you know, like I say, I'd have like three lines in, at, at the very best. And really, I think the only time uh, I was face to face with anyone uh, was Art Carney. Otherwise, I'd be an anchor and I'd be behind the desk. And I'd do my bit, and then I'd leave. Right? Uh, I was in a Hallmark movie. I was the uh, MC of a uh, ice sculpturing contest, but the, and I had quite a few lines. But the beauty of it was, I was standing at a podium, and I was the master of ceremonies. 
So naturally, the master of ceremonies is going to look down and just script every time. So I would say there, otherwise, I'd still be there trying to remember the lines. In 2000, Saturday Night did the famous uh, magazine cover with you and eight other Canadian game show hosts. How did it feel to to be honored as one of Canada's great game show hosts? It was fabulous, yeah. Uh, it was great. What, what I was so excited about was uh, meeting Alex Trebek and meeting uh, Monty Hall, both Canadians, as you know, and then also meeting some of the guys across the country who, who had... Um, Done some game shows along the way too. I, I you know, there's some I knew already, like Stu Jeffries. I knew him already. Pat Bullard. Yeah, I, uh, I, I didn't. I, I hadn't met him before. No, uh, most of the guys I hadn't met because most of them were working out of Toronto. And uh, we we did a few shows in Vancouver, uh, uh, like Blair Murdoch's uh, shows that he did. Stu's show I think was called Love Handles. Uh, and um, then there was another, there was another one too that Blair did. But um, yeah, most of the other productions were done in Toronto. Val Dubois, did you ever work with him prior to, or meet him prior no. to that? Okay. No. no. So talking about the Canada Game Show, were you were the narrator for the Search for Canada's Game Shows? Mm -hmm. How did it feel to be sort of the voice of Canadian game shows, as it were? Yeah, I, I, did, I, I didn't actually know how it was going to work because uh, it, it started out as I was one of the subjects in the documentary series. So they came out and did an interview with me as, as one of Canada's game show hosts, which was fine, and finished that. And then a couple of weeks later, they called and said, uh, we're looking for a narrator. Would you, would you want to do the narration? And I said, well, sure, but I know how's that going to work? How am I going to introduce myself? kind of thing. Oh, that's okay, so we'll work around it. And as it turned out, I think it worked out fine because uh, I the, the way they, they did the editing and everything, it, it didn't turn out that way. But uh, but yeah, it was fun. Yeah, and it was, uh, I thought it was an interesting series, uh, you know, get, going right to the very beginning and the start of Canadian game shows coming out of the, uh, the game show scandals in the U.S., you know, getting getting their birth not through a scandal, but because those people had to go and work somewhere. Yeah, I, I found it really interesting. Do you, when were you inducted into the the British Columbia Hall of Fame for Entertainment? Uh, it was when I was still working with well Fred Latrimo, a, a local disc jockey in Vancouver, who's passed away now. But uh, Fred, uh, I was the weather guy on Fred's radio morning show. And when we both got the word at the same time that we were going to be inducted into the BC Entertainment Hall of Fame, and we didn't, we didn't quite understand. We go, really? Oh, well, isn't that? Oh, that's really cool. And, and then when we actually went to the uh, the ceremony, and uh, you know, we were given a plaque and we were going to star in the, the sidewalk and things like that, then it really started to hit home to us. Like, oh, this is very cool. And both of us, um, you know, being Vancouver natives, virtually all our lives, uh, you know, born here and, and the whole thing. Uh, it was really a, a great honor, and uh, I, I still think of it as a great honor. What would you say was your proudest achievement in the world of broadcasting? I think just being employed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's uh, it's such a crazy it's such a crazy business, and and just being able to last as long as I did. Um, there's a lot of guys I worked with who just uh, for one reason or another, decided that was it. They were done. They're out of here. They're going to go drive a bus or a truck or do anything else. I just kept getting work, which I was very grateful for all the time, and especially getting work into something I really enjoyed. The, those two things, uh, quite a blessing. Well, for anyone out there who would want to take that role, what advice would you have for someone who wanted to get in the world of broadcasting? Gee, it, it's changed so much, and not it? Um, you know, when I first got in there, you know, there was radio, there was television, um, there was movies, and that's about it. Well, that pie has now been cut up into so many small pieces, the Internet and, you know, everything that goes with that. The competition is just just for eyeballs, just to get someone's attention. The competition is fierce now, way more than, I mean, we always thought it was competitive back in the day, but now, oh, my goodness, you know, 
it's uh, I, I just don't know which direction traditional broadcasting is going to take. take. All it takes is to go watch the Emmy Awards and realize how many awards were handed out, not to the traditional networks, but to Netflix and, and all the other cable kind of things. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I guess there's still, there's still room for the traditional uh, TV jobs, but it's, it's got to be tougher now. I know you're retired now, but if someone came to you and said, Hey, we wanted you to host this game show or just be a guest on this game show or host it, would you do it? I'm not an agent. I'm not, I'm, this, sounds like <laughs> I, this sounds like I'm asking you on behalf of, no, <laughs> I'm just curious if you would ever consider doing that work again. Oh, sure. Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't, you know, now that I'm retired, because it was like, like I was in the business for, I don't know, 45 years. I don't want to go back to Monday to Friday. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, if it was a, oh yeah, if it was a game show especially, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, the only thing I'm doing now really is uh, I'm emceeing shows, uh, musical shows. We have a, a recording studio uh, here in, in the White Rock area. Um, and it's a, a sound studio in the day. And then usually on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, they'll put on concerts, musicians. So they'll go into the big sound studio, set up a hundred seats, and there's a stage, lighting, and of course the acoustics are perfect. And so they sell tickets, and, um, and I'm, for a lot of the shows, I'm the MC guy. So jump up there and welcome the people and, Tell them what they're going to see, what they're going to do, introduce the acts, thank them for coming at the end, and just kind of keep keeps my chops in you know live live entertainment, which which I love, and I love live music, so it's it's great. I don't get paid much. I get paid two tickets to the show and two drink tickets. So. <laughs> it's one of the better contracts I've ever had. <laughs> you know, we, we live in a world now, television-wise, where so much stuff is pre-recorded. What do you think makes live television or makes live performance such something that people still desire, even though so much stuff now is pre-recorded? Yeah, it's pretty exciting, I think, for one one thing. And you only you only have one shot at it. There's no, there's no take two, take three, take four. And it's funny, you know, uh, when things are, like, I've done a lot of live things like telethons and where it's all live and away you go. First of all, it's exciting. And second of all, you know you don't have a cushion. It's it's out there. It's free fall. And so many times you go only to record a commercial and uh, you just don't have the same spark, the same energy as you do when something's live. Because you have that realization that uh, you don't consciously think of it, but I think unconsciously you realize well, if it doesn't work out this first tape, I can have two or three more tapes. Whereas live, whoops, it's it's on. And that's why the the two-hour show, the Vancouver show, was so exciting to do. Because you started at 7 o'clock, not 7.05, not 7.10. You started right at 7 o'clock, and you had to get it all in by 9 o'clock. And that was exciting. It was fun. So I have a list of names of people that you have worked with. Or work for. I would just have one a quick thought on each one. You brought up Fred Latremol. Yeah. Can you, you know, what was he like? Fred was an interesting guy. Very, very intelligent. Very funny. Um, when we worked together for so many years, he he almost he became the older brother that I never had in real life. And uh, we just we connected. We hit it off. Uh, he 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 was just a great talent. Great talent. Yeah. And and sadly missed. Wink Martindale? Wink was terrific. Um, Wink, uh, I looked up to because of, you know, his success in, in game shows over the years. And he had great stories all the time. Uh, I know I went down and stayed at his place when he had a, he had a house in Malibu there for a while. And we went down and stayed for a few days with him and his wife, Sandy. And, um, uh, he was very gracious and took me to CBS television and, uh, I uh, watched him record a couple of games, and uh, he showed me around, introduced me around to people. Real nice. Uh, I really enjoyed him. Yeah. And what great set of pipes he's got. Oh, my God. Uh, great voice. You have a good one, too. I'm sure well, you hear that a lot. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Gilden. Jerry was a, he was he was great. Like I say, we hit it off 
right at the beginning, uh, uh, just because of, you know, where we shop for clothes more than anything. But, uh, yeah, Jerry, I haven't, I haven't talked to Jerry in a long time. I know he, uh, and Wink had the production company going there for a while. And then I, I heard that Jerry got right out of the business. He went into commercial real estate or something. Uh, so I, lo- I lost track with him, but I always got along with him. Uh, got along with him great. Bill Elliott? Bill Elliott was, uh, oh, talk about Mr. Cool, uh, under pressure. Uh, Bill was, uh, terrific. He was the director on the second honeymoon. And he, working along with Tony Blake, they were a good combination because <laughs> he, Bill was so calm and Tony had so much energy, but, uh, they spent hours uh, together getting that second honeymoon show all pieced together. It was great. Doc Harris. Doc, yeah, Doc Harris, uh, I've known Doc for a long time, a disc jockey for years, and he was our, uh, offstage announcer in the second honeymoon. Very funny guy, very creative, hardworking, and I, I see him time to time. We had a lot of the, uh, old guys get together for, uh, uh, luncheons, uh, uh, twice, three times a year, and Doc usually shows up and, uh, he's always fun to talk to. Mark Maxwell Smith. There you go, there's, there's another guy that, uh, we hit it off immediately and uh we've been in touch ever since we were we were doing talk about he's he's just so smart so bright so funny he spends a lot of time now with uh kids with special needs kind of a camp uh where he entertains them and uh acts as a a counselor and uh he's just a terrific guy and i'm just i don't know i can't say i can't say enough about him because he's just uh he's a very special person in my life dean hill Dean Hill, another disc jockey uh, in Vancouver, he was our uh, offstage announcer for Talk About. And uh, Dean has a great, great voice, a great set of pipes, a real good uh, commercial announcer. And uh, he's still going. He's 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 still on the radio and uh, uh, and loving it. And I, I again at these luncheon things, I bump into to Dean um, every so often. But uh, a great talent, great great voice. Michael Watt. Michael Watt, boy. Michael Watt, I haven't, I haven't seen Michael for a long, long time, but, uh, always enjoyed, always enjoyed him and, uh, enjoyed working with him. And, uh, uh, gosh, that, I haven't, I haven't heard Michael's name for a, for a while. Interesting. Yeah. Blair Murdoch? Blair is just a, he's a, he is so much, he's so much fun. And, uh, I enjoyed the years of working with, with Blair and, uh, acting crazy. And, uh, he was, he, he just had that way about him that not much bothered Blair. And, and he had his, he had his finger in so many pies. Just TV production was just one of the many things. Uh, he was a great businessman, but he also had a terrific flair for show business. He understood it and he understood the people in show business. And I think that really helped him. And, um, I don't, I don't know if he's going to get back into, uh, uh television production again or not. Uh, I haven't talked to him for a while. A terrific guy. Lots of fun. Did you work with Jackie Swanson? Was she the line on that show, or was there a different line producer? Yeah, no, she, uh, yeah, she was more or less, uh, Blair's right hand person. Uh, they worked together, uh, in a production company and also when the, when we were shooting too. Um, Jackie, I haven't, haven't seen for a while, although I did see her on the, um, game show, uh, Canadian game show series, uh, but I, I hadn't seen her for, a, for quite a while. Because I don't, I don't know. I don't think she's working with Blair any. Yeah, she she was she was a steadying force. Put it that way. Stu Jeffries. Stu Jeffries. I I've now been in touch with it again after quite a few years of, of not being in touch because he's in in the Toronto area. He again a great radio guy, and he's got a, a very successful morning show uh, out of Toronto. We always, we had, has lots of fun. And we, uh, we went together on that, uh, photo shoot down to Los Angeles with all the Canadian game. And, uh, the two of us kind of hung out, uh, together. And he's, he's lots of fun. And I remember him from the, an old show he used to do called Good Rockin' Tonight, uh, that was a, a, a TV, sort of a, it was sort of before MTV maybe, before uh, that kind of video kind of thing. And yeah, he's, he's great talent and lots, lots of fun. Good guy. And my one chance to make the obvious joke. Talk about Wayne Cox. <laughs> well, it's time to go now. Good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah.
No, I, I've just been very blessed. Uh, you know, all those people you talk about, just great people to be around, and I've had a, a, a lot of fun uh, throughout the years. And if it wasn't fun, I got out of it. And uh, mostly fun and exciting, and it was a, a great run, and uh, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Thank you for telling your story. Gosh, thanks for having me, Joshua. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's my honor. My privilege.